I hear your footsteps, old man, as they sandwalk to the movies this week to see a bunch of new releases covered in this episode of Film Feeder. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the show, where every week I, your film chef extraordinaire, Jack Martin, surf up all the info on the latest films coming to cinema, streaming, and on demand, and also offer up my own thoughts on just some of the newest releases. And if you couldn't tell from my opening words, this week is all about Dune Part 2, the hugely anticipated second half of Denis Villeneuve's massive adaptation of the classic Frank Herbert sci-fi novel, which finally arrives after being delayed from November last year due to the then ongoing sag after strikes, preventing any of the star-studded cast from doing the necessary promotional circuit. So this week, I'll not only bring you a handful of reasons why you should be excited for it, but later on I'll also be able to deliver my actual thoughts on the film, since Warner Brothers invited me along to an early screening of it, which was perhaps the busiest press and multimedia showing I've ever been to, as the place was absolutely packed with virtually every seat in the giant IMAX screen in London's Leicester Square occupied by at least someone, even in the bottom left and right corners where the massive screen was just right in front of their eyes, and having been right at the front, and of that screen i can tell you that it is not easy to look at everything being projected from that angle so props to whoever ended up in those seats because man i wish i wasn't one of them however it's not just dune part 2 that's making its debut as there's a whole other slew of releases bravely going up alongside the epic blockbuster and i'll be diving into those during my ever useful movie menu section momentarily but before i continue if you haven't already i'd like to encourage you to give film vida a follow on its many social media channels including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and many others, with the handles and links all listed in the episode description. And please do visit both the Film Feeder website at filmfeeder.co.uk, which is the home of all my exclusive written content, and do consider subscribing to one of the paid tiers on Patreon at patreon.com slash filmfeeder, where members can get a whole bunch of exclusive treats, including special early access to certain podcast episodes, and a whole lot more. So once again, that's patreon.com slash filmfeeder if you want to support Support Film Feeder today. So, with all of that out of the way, let's get right into this week's movie menu. And now, preview time. When it comes to entertainment, you can't beat a good film. So, let's take a look at what's coming your way. It's no secret as to what the movie of the week is, given how I've already spent a good chunk of this episode talking about it, but Dune Part 2 really is the cream of the crop among this week's film releases, with sci-fi fans in for a treat as they witness the continuation of Frank Herbert's story, which follows Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides as he allies himself with the native Fremen of the desert planet Arrakis, after a coup by his family's sworn enemies the Harkonnens has left him exiled and his father dead, and eventually he becomes their their messiah-like figure who may or may not lead them to victory. But if that wasn't enough to get your taste buds salivating, allow me to deliver five solid reasons why you should be excited for this film. Number one, it's been a long, long wait for the second half, with Dune Part 1, also directed by Denis Villeneuve, being released all the way back in 2021, during that period when Warner Brothers decided to go day and date with all of their theatrical releases that were simultaneously released on its streaming service HBO Max in the States, which was of course done as the industry was starting to recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the move was derided by many passionate cinema supporters, including Christopher Nolan, who in response jumped chip to Universal where he ended up making Oppenheimer, and like with many of the studio's releases that year, Dune Part 1's box office performance was clearly affected by that decision, even though it still ended up being its highest grossing film of that year, a fate that could well also fall to Dune Part 2 when it arrives exclusively this time in cinemas. Number two, it's got one hell of a starry cast, led by Timothy Chalamet, who reprises his role in this film, alongside other returning players like Zendaya, Rebecca Ferguson, Josh Brolin, Dave Bautista, Stellan Skarsgård, Charlotte Rampling, and Javier Bardem, with new additions including a collection of fresher faces and one or two acting legends, including Florence Pugh, Austin Butler, Leah Seydoux, and Christopher Walken, the latter playing none other than the malevolent emperor of the sci-fi universe. 
Number three, in addition to Villeneuve, there's also plenty of talent behind the camera as well, many of whom are returning after picking up a bunch of Oscars for their work on the first film, including cinematographer Greg Fraser, editor Joe Walker, the teams behind the stunning visual effects and sound design, and of course the musical legend himself Hans Zimmer, who once again provides a bombastic score worthy of this absolutely epic narrative. Number four, while the first part was considerably more world-building and stoic in tone, which wowed many but also put some people off for its somewhat cold nature, at least for this kind of sci-fi blockbuster, Dune Part 2 contains a lot more action, much of it on a scale that is monumental to say the least, all while still retaining its fascinating exploration of the deep themes and complex characters at the heart of Villeneuve and co-writer John Spate's script. And finally, the fifth reason that you should be excited to see Dune Part 2 is that just because this marks the conclusion of the original Dune novel doesn't mean that it's the end of the entire Dune saga, for Frank Herbert wrote a whole bunch of follow-up books that are also right for the big screen, with Villeneuve publicly stating that he wants to make the first sequel, entitled Dune Messiah, as the capper to his trilogy, depending on how well Dune Part 2 does, which given how it's already scoring through the roof with critics, and is set to light the global box office on fire, I I think it's fair to assume that this is not going to be the last time on Arrakis under Denis Villeneuve's watch. So those are five reasons to convince you all that Dune Part 2 is worth seeing on the big screen, as if you needed to be convinced at all, and you can look forward to hearing my thoughts on the film later on in the show, but for now you can expect the film to make a serious impact when it arrives in cinemas from Friday the 1st of March. There's not that many other cinema releases that are brave enough to open alongside Dune Part 2, but one of the few is Lisa Frankenstein, the coming-of-age comedy with a Mary Shelley twist, which comes from debut director Zelda Williams and Oscar-winning writer Diablo Cody, known for the likes of Juno and cult favourite Jennifer's Body, and it tells the story of Catherine Newton's Lisa, an eccentric teenager in the late 1980s, who has developed an infatuation with the buried corpse of a Victorian young man, played by Cole Sprouse, who suddenly comes to life after a freak accident, and soon the two unexpected lovebirds set out on a journey to be together, one body limb at a time. Fans of Jennifer's body may be interested to know that, while there isn't an exact link per se, Lisa Frankenstein does apparently take place in the same universe, and just like that film, you can expect its cult film status to only grow as time goes by, so make sure you saw it at the very beginning of its infamy from the 1st of March, when it rises in cinemas courtesy of distributor Universal Pictures. Next, we have a very different kind of coming-of-age story, this one taking into account an often unmentioned part of 20th century history. It is Red Island, the French drama from writer-director Robin Campillo, who takes inspiration from his own childhood growing up on a military base within the colony of Madagascar during the 1970s, where his fictional younger self Thomas, played by young actor Charlie Vossel, loses himself in regular fantasies with the comic superhero Fantomet, portrayed here by Calissa Oscal Oul, while the colony descends into chaos amidst the tense political climate. The film has an interesting way of showing the international power that France still had in the 20th century, and unlike in the recent Oscar contender The Zone of Interest, the harsh underlying realities are directly addressed here, but never to where it takes away from the innocent perspective, and should still open up the conversation about colonial territories across the world, especially throughout the past couple of centuries. So that's Red Island, which is coming to cinemas via Curzon, and will be available to rent exclusively on Curzon Home Cinema from the 1st of March. Then there's Four Daughters, the Oscar-nominated documentary from filmmaker Katha Benhania, who creates a unique portrait of patriarchal society in Tunisia that firmly puts the focus on the oppressed women, specifically a family headed by central subject Ulfa Hamruni, the mother of four beautiful young daughters, two of whom suddenly disappear and are replaced on the screen by professional actors, who help the remaining daughters and their mother cope with their untimely loss. Now this one is interesting because it blends fact and fiction seamlessly with dramatised reenactments of moments in the central family's life, which in and of itself opens up a wave of emotions as the family and the actors portraying the missing members all struggle to cope with their overwhelming feelings of loss and oppression, setting the stage for a rather emotional filmic experiment that you can see for yourselves when Four Daughters arrives in cinemas through distributor Modern Films on the 1st of March. 
Another documentary follows, though this one is no less harrowing. It's Theatre of Violence, which tells the story of Dominic Ongwen, who was abducted from his home in Africa when he was just nine years old, and forcibly conscripted into an army of child soldiers headed by Joseph Kony, who you may recognise from the short-lived 2012 viral activism campaign against him, with the film focusing on Ongwen's legal journey 30 years later, when he becomes the first former child soldier to be charged with war crimes by the International Criminal Court, and he, along with lawyer Crispus Ayena makes his case that he is a victim more than he is a murderer. The case that follows drudges up the horrors of being captured and indoctrinated into murderous lifestyles from a very early age, an all too common process for children living in the most remote parts of the African continent. And the film, by directors Lucas Conapa and Emil Langbell, is one that dares you to confront the truth about real evils in this world, which you can do when Theatre of Violence arrives in cinemas through distributed Dogworth on the 1st of March. If you're hoping that this week's selection gets any brighter after documentaries about child soldiers and patriarchal oppression, Driving Mum is a dark comedy about an introverted middle-aged man transporting the corpse of his domineering mother across the country to fulfil her final wishes, so it's certainly not looking that much rosier on the other side. Slightly morbid plot aside, this is a highly amusing film that is a co-production between Iceland and Estonia, with it also being the first film by Icelandic director Hilmar Odson in over 15 years. And following in the tradition of Anatomy of a Fall, it features an adorable dog by the name of Brezhnev, who all but steals the show from his human co-stars. So if that's won you over, then by all means seek out Driving Mum, a Toll Stories release that opens on the 1st of March. The last of this week's cinema releases is thankfully a much lighter one. It's the family-friendly superhero comedy Combat Wombat Double Trouble, the Australian animated film that's the third and final entry in the Tales from Sanctuary City franchise, the other two being the previously released films The Wishmas Tree and Daisy Quacker, with this one being about a lazy wombat who unexpectedly becomes the newest superhero of the animal-populated Sanctuary City, which draws the ire of another masked Avenger who then sets out to orchestrate his new rival's demise. It's light and inoffensive family entertainment that should tide over many young superhero fans, but there's only one way to be sure, and that's to check out Combat Wombat Double Trouble when it comes to cinemas via Signature Entertainment on Friday the 1st of March. Moving on now to the week's big streaming and on-demand releases, perhaps the most eye-catching one is Netflix's new sci-fi drama Spaceman, which stars Adam Sandler as a lonely astronaut that makes an unexpected new friend on his solo mission into the cosmos. I won't say too much about it now, because I'll be going deeper into my thoughts on the film later on, but with Sandler on top form in his most ambitious dramatic role yet, opposite the likes of Kerry Mulligan, Paul Dano and Isabella Rossellini, Spaceman should be high on your to-watch list when it begins streaming exclusively on Netflix from Friday the 1st of March. Also coming to Netflix this week is a slightly more grounded sci-fi movie, Code 8 Part 2, the follow-up to the 2019 film that got a surprise following on the streamer during the early days of the pandemic, when it appeared on its top 10 films list in the United States. So now they're fully behind the sequel, which once again stars Robbie Amell, a super-powered former convict Connor Reed, and a future where 4% of the population has some kind of superhuman ability. And he's drawn back to his former partner in crime Garrett, played by Robbie's brother Stephen Amell, after he's been entrusted with the safety of a young teenager after they've been targeted by a group of corrupt cops. Those who managed to see the first film, which itself was based on the short of the same name by Jeff Chan, who also directed both features, can expect to see much more superpowered action on a slightly larger canvas, and possibly even setting the stage for a third part as well. But that only happens if people stream or download Code 8 Part 2, following its release on Netflix from Wednesday the 28th of February. Then we have the first of this week's two on-demand titles, which is funnily enough yet another sci-fi thriller, this one being Monolith, an Australian psychological horror from director Matt Vesely, and it stars Lily Sullivan, previously seen wielding a chainsaw like an utter badass in last year's Evil Dead Rise, as a disgraced reporter who begins an investigative podcast about unsolved mysteries in an attempt to revitalise her career. But when she starts looking into a phenomenon that involves a strange artifact that might be of alien origin, she uncovers a web of lies at the centre of her own story. 
The intriguing aspect of this film is that Sullivan is the only actor present on the screen, with all other actors heard through vocals only, very similar to writer-director Stephen Knight's film Locke, which just had Tom Hardy on screen the whole time. But there is an unnerving tension to this film that ultimately leads to some shocking twists, which you can discover for yourself right now, as Monolith is now available to rent or buy from most digital platforms, including Amazon, Sky Store, Google Play, and many more. And finally, Cold Meats from Signature Entertainment is the gripping and terrifying survival story set within the snowy Rocky Mountains in Colorado, where a passerby, played by Downton Abbey star Alan Leach, heroically saves young diner waitress Anna, played by Nina Bergman, from her abusive husband. But then the two of them end up becoming stranded in their car during a strong blizzard, leaving the two of them to do whatever they can to survive. With its many unpredictable turns as well as some frostbitten cinematography that makes a blizzard more unnerving than it already can be, Cold Meese is a thriller that will leave you breathless, as it did for many audience members during its world premiere at last year's Fright Fest event in London's Leicester Square. And you can now check it out for yourself as Cold Meat is also now available to digitally rent or buy. So that brings this week's movie menu to a comfortable close. Hopefully you found at least one film to get excited for over the next seven days. And don't forget to leave a comment saying which film you're most pumped for and why. But enough dawdling, it's time to get to what you've been undoubtedly waiting for. My official take on this week's biggest release, which I'll now reveal in my ever insightful review section. As I mentioned earlier, I got invited to an advanced press screening for Dune Part 2 last week, and with the review embargo officially lifted, I can now reveal whether or not the two-year wait for Denis Villeneuve's second part of his massive Frank Herbert adaptation was worth the wait. After years of failed attempts to adapt Frank Herbert's classic sci-fi novel Dune for the big screen, Denis Villeneuve succeeded where the likes of Alejandro Jodorowsky and David Lynch didn't, by splitting the roughly 900-page book into two separate films. This allowed for a grander and less restrictive exploration of the worlds and themes introduced in Herbert's genre-defying tome, particularly in Villeneuve's first half, released back in 2021, which laid the foundations for this universe, turning the lengthy but necessary exposition into a vision stimulating exercise of world building, on a level not seen on the big screen since Peter Jackson first invited audiences to Middle Earth. Now with Dune Part 2, Villeneuve builds on top of everything he previously established, and crafts a film that is many things all at once, a war drama, a sci-fi action adventure, and a dense commentary on the dangers of religion, martyrdom, and the corruption of power, just to name a few. And yet it never loses sight of just how unapologetically massive this source material is. Make no mistake, Dune Part 2 is all capitals epic, and a resounding accomplishment for big-budget, auteur-driven filmmaking that depressingly few major studio pictures are allowed to be nowadays. Much like the first part, Dune Part 2 spends much of its near three-hour runtime exploring and expanding upon the deeply embedded mythologies and environments that Frank Herbert originally created. However, with much of the world-building exposition already covered in Dune Part 1, Villeneuve has freer reign here to craft a wide variety of engrossing action sequences within the mechanics of the established universe, many of which reiterate the enormous scale of Herbert's far-reaching story, more than even the first film was able to. There are scenes in this movie where you feel the absolute size of these sets, these landscapes, and the thematically rich narrative binding them all together, as Villeneuve brings an invigorating attitude to set pieces, such as ones where Timothy Chalamet's Paul leads a number of sabotage missions with his Fremen allies, then later when he learns how to ride one of the planet's many giant sandworms, and finally an awe-inspiring climax that just screams its operatic nature to the audience. It is a testament to Villeneuve's skills as an invigorating filmmaker that he never gets too carried away with the action, retaining his grittier and thematically driven directorial style previously used in the likes of Sicario and Blade Runner 2049, and also lends his undeniable passion to several heads of department who all, under the director's watch, turn it into an exceptionally crafted production. Cinematographer Greg Fraser, who won an Oscar for his work on Dune Part 1, continues to create some dazzling sun-drenched imagery that turns the barren desert wastelands of Arrakis into an awe-inspiring canvas, as everything from the low orange sunsets to faraway shots riddled with heat distortion looks like the closest equivalent to a modern-day David Lean epic we've yet had. 
And even when we venture to other planets, such as one coated in stunning monochrome, where the fireworks are black Rorschach test ink dots, the artistry never fails to elicit an awed response, as Fraser, along with the set and costume designers, as well as a supremely talented team of visual effects artists and sound designers, and of course a bellowing musical score courtesy of Hans Zimmer, brings a grounded sense of beauty to each lived-in corner of this galaxy. This is an all-around stunning piece of filmmaking, as headed by Villeneuve's exhilarating direction that brings out the pure might and power of this giant story. And the themes of said story are ones that he and co-writer John Spates pay close attention to in their thought-provoking script. The screenwriters are clearly drawn to the concept of how prophetic figures, like the one that Paul Atreides is being hyped up to be, are the result of carefully calculated propaganda that is developed and spread among vulnerable sects by external forces. For a good chunk of the film, we see Rebecca Ferguson's Lady Jessica in her new role as the Fremen's Reverend Mother, wherein she somewhat sinisterly uses her position, as well as her previously gained powers as a member of the Bene Gesserit, who are basically witch nuns, to convert the remaining skeptics towards a cult-like worship of the supposed messiah. And although this can at times lead to some funny misinterpretations by his devoted followers, in moments that seem like Villeneuve is perhaps a big fan of life of Brian, the parallels between Jessica's mission and the real-life fundamentalists that similarly enforce the spread of religious devotion within oppressed communities are uniformly stark. Furthermore, it's made clear at multiple junctions that the prophecy surrounding Paul might not necessarily lead to a good outcome, with visions predicting a disturbing future that may come as a result of the exiled Atreides, assuming full power of not just Arrakis, but the universe as a whole. And Villeneuve and Spates' script is smart in how it shows the darker aspects of this particular hero's journey narrative, especially as it flirts with the possible turn towards anti-heroism for its protagonist, who despite becoming one with the natives, cannot entirely shake away his privileged birthright. And this makes the character a lot more interesting than if he did just turn out to be Space Jesus, which a much more traditional filmmaker would have undoubtedly lent further into as a means of simplifying a deeply complex narrative. It's fair to say, after all of that, that Villeneuve has delivered a truly fantastic sci-fi vision with both parts of this massive Dune adaptation, which cannot have been easy to realise, with the original Frank Herbert novel once thought to have been unadaptable, again both Alejandro Jodorowsky and David Lynch can vouch for that, but thanks to his bold and grand approach that comes hand in hand with fantastic craftsmanship, he's delivered a bona fide multi-film epic for the ages. So in all, Dune Part 2 is a fantastically realised sci-fi epic that sees director Denis Villeneuve conclude the first book in Frank Herbert's series with an awe-inspiring scope that features incredible craftsmanship and a heavy focus on the story's complex themes, which I am giving the full five stars, which equates to top quality cuisine. So make sure you get it in your stomach when the film, once again, opens in cinemas on Friday the 1st of March. Now, if you're in the mood for even more sci-fi, allow me to share my thoughts on the week's other major genre release, Spaceman, which comes to Netflix later this week. And here's a sentence I've never thought I'd say, Adam Sandler is one of the best actors working today. I mean, you wouldn't think, with a filmography that largely consists of juvenile comedies like Billy Madison, I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, and the Grown Ups movies, that Sandler was capable of a performance that was legitimately stronger and more nuanced than most of his other fellow thespians. Yet he's proven everyone wrong time and time again with excellent and genuinely awards-worthy turns in the likes of Punch Drunk Love, Uncut Gems, Hustle, and now Spaceman, which perhaps features his most ambitious dramatic work to date. Sandler, of course, turns in an astonishing performance as the lead in director Johann Renk's moody and cerebral adaptation of Jaroslav Kalfar's novel Spaceman of Bohemia, which, like its hopeless protagonist, reaches for the stars and tries to grasp something profound, despite it not always being within its reach. In the film, Sandler is Jakob, a Czech astronaut who is six months into a solo mission deep into the cosmos, where he's been tasked by his government to investigate a strange purple phenomenon that has seeped into Earth's skies for the past four years. Jakob is under immense pressure to fulfil his duties, so much so that his emotional neglect of his heavily pregnant wife Lenka, played by Kerry Mulligan, has caused her to leave him. Not that he knows that, for the news is withheld from Jakob to keep him focused on the task at hand. Even still, Jakob is left in a psychologically challenging isolated state, which is exacerbated by the sudden arrival of a very unlikely passenger, a giant spider-like creature named Hanush, voiced by Paul Dano, which begins to serve as Jakob's soft-spoken therapist as he prods the human's memories in an attempt to better understand the human condition. Though it might seem otherwise, I assure you that this Adam Sandler film where he plays an astronaut that eventually befriends a cuddly CGI spider is most certainly not another one of his light-hearted comedies. 
The film is, in fact, a deeply soulful and understated character study that director Rank and screenwriter Colby Day are careful not to overplay, even when the CG arachnid is present. As more about Sandler's Jakob is revealed, from his tragic past as the son of a proud communist during Czechoslovakia's breakthrough from the Soviet Union, which he is now desperately trying to redeem by participating in this dangerous mission, to the increasingly distant attitude he has with Mulligan's Lenka whilst back on Earth, it becomes clear that he's rather self-serving and even kind of pathetic on top of his numerous other flaws. Crucially though, he is never unlikable, as Sandler lends his character plenty of sympathy to where he can still see an actual human underneath that misguided mindset. And and as Spaceman slowly floats towards a somewhat inevitable, to a point, conclusion, it's hard to not feel some kind of emotion for his ultimate growth that comes in part from, of all places, the giant spider that may or may not even be real. And Hanush the Spider is an unexpectedly warm presence in this movie, which as someone who is afraid of giant insects is quite shocking for me to even declare. Through a mixture of photorealistic effects and Paul Dano's soothing vocal performance, Hanush is not as ridiculous as he very easily could have been. In fact, he serves as the beating heart of the entire movie, one that even Jakob can't resist after a certain point, and the friendship that develops between the two of them is a bizarrely endearing strand that both Rank and Day take remarkably seriously, even when Jakob is introducing his alien companion to chocolate spreads and giving him a big hug that, in lesser hands, could have been a laughable image. Instead, the moment is incredibly sweet and tender, because both the characters that you have grown to enjoy being around, while the stylish filmmaking is gentle enough to allow such a moment to feel earned at this point in the story. However, it is when Spaceman ventures outside of its contained drama that the film loses some of its momentum. Scenes set on Earth that largely follow Lenka after abandoning her spacebound husband, who's also the father of her unborn child, lack the nuance and grace that the scenes between Jakob and Hanush carry. Because despite Kerry Mulligan's strong performance, the character is written to be much more one note and therefore less interesting. And it's difficult to get emotionally involved in these scenes, largely due to how the writing doesn't take nearly as much time developing this character or her own motivations, which come across as empty and ill-defined in the final product. There's also a final section of the movie that doesn't wholly work. It's the only part of the film that is somehow the most conventional and effects heavy, but also the most artsy and experimental, and neither of them mesh particularly well together. Because while there is some beautiful cinematography and effects work on display here, as well as a rather moving score by Max Richter, it struggles to maintain the more intimate drama that the film has spent most of its running time setting up, and just loses itself within a manipulative and borderline pretentious exploration of concepts well beyond human and understanding. It feels like it was a note from Netflix to add some action into this otherwise action-free narrative, and then to homage the likes of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Solaris to win some points from film snobs. But despite its flaws, Spaceman has enough moments of strength to achieve orbit, especially with Adam Sandler delivering one of his most committed dramatic performances that signal even greater things to come from the former clown. So, Spaceman is ultimately a three-star movie, or a decent stomach filler that is an ambitious sci-fi character study that features an excellently performance by Adam Sandler, where he forms a heartfelt bond with a cuddly CGI spider, which is less ridiculous than it sounds. But it doesn't always work as undercooked supporting characters and an unbalanced climax leave it less profound than it desires. But once again, you can find it streaming on Netflix from the 1st of March. And that concludes yet another episode of Film Feeder. As always, I'm so thankful that you took the time to listen about all of this week's new releases. And if you want to further show your support, then there's plenty of ways you can do that. For starters, you can leave a nice review or star rating on whichever platform you may be listening on. And you can also like and follow Film Feeder on any one of its many social media pages, the links and handles to which are all listed in the episode description. But perhaps most notably, you can go to patreon.com slash filmfeeder and become a paid subscriber, while getting some tasty extra perks as a special thanks for supporting a hardworking creative like myself. And of course, don't forget to visit the actual Film Feeder website at filmfeeder.co.uk, where you can find all of my written reviews Views, including some other ones that I haven't covered on this week's episode. I hope to welcome you back next week when I'll be looking at Ava DuVernay's latest passion project, Origin, among many other new releases. But until then, I'm Jack Martin, your film chef extraordinaire, whetting your appetite for film each and every week. That's all for now. See you next time.